So moving on, we're really grateful to have Professor Theresa McDonough here next, and uh, she's going to talk to us about heart failure management, what we need to know. And um, um, Professor McDonough is, 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 comes from King's, King's College Hospital, where she heads up the heart failure program, and her, and her main interests are um, novel biomarkers in heart failure and the delivery of heart failure services. Um, so we're very grateful to you today for spending the time to come to us. Thank you. Thank you very much, and it's, uh, it's great to be here in person, and I haven't done it for a while, so I hope I get the controls and everything right. Uh, at least we're not using Zoom. These are my conflicts of interest, and I don't think any of them are really in any way relevant to my talk. And there's been, uh, because I've been the chair of an ESC guideline, I've not had any conflicts of interest for the last year. So, today, what the, the title is, what do I need to know about heart failure? You know, that obviously depends a bit on who you are, because I think what I need to know about heart failure is probably slightly different to this audience. So I've, I've tried to pitch my talk as to what I think a GP should uh, know about heart failure. I, I apologise if I've overdone that or underdone it, but it's my best shot at it. So I thought I'd talk today rather than the a la carte dining menu for heart failure the table doubt menu, so we'll, uh, we'll skip the epidemiology and the management of diabetes and heart failure, etc., because I'm um, just focus on uh, the management of chronic heart failure, not acute heart failure, which obviously happens in hospital. So the starter is going to be definition and diagnosis. The main course is going to be how to treat heart failure with reduced left ventricular systolic function, otherwise known as, you have to get some lingo here, hef ref. Uh, and the dessert is how you might treat heart failure with preserved left ventricular systolic function, or HEF-PEF. So first of all, what is heart failure? Well, I'm sure you'll remember from medical school the, the definition and inability of the heart to pump sufficient oxygen to the metabolizing tissues despite an adequate filling pressure. Not any use for anything other than the laboratory rat. So we've now got very clinical definitions of heart failure to guide us. So this is the most recent definition from the ESC guideline, which I think is the latest of the guidelines to, re, um, to revamp itself. So first of all, it's not a single pathological diagnosis. Of course, it's a syndrome. A syndrome is a constellation of symptoms and signs. In this case, breathlessness usually, tiredness, um, signs of uh, peripheral or uh, pulmonary congestion, but the key thing is that these symptoms and signs must come because of cardiac structural or functional abnormalities and not any other cause of breathlessness. So the symptoms and signs, as you know very well, are myriad. The typical ones, um, breathlessness, orthopnea, PND, but a whole host of other uh, signs and symptoms. In terms of what I would say about the symptoms and signs, no matter how good you think your clinical acumen is, or indeed how, how good I think mine is, if we try to diagnose heart failure on these symptoms and signs, we get it wrong 50% of the time, in primary care or in secondary care. The problem is the symptoms are either not sensitive enough, or if they are sensitive, they're not specific and similarly to the signs. So they should, I think, they, all symptoms and signs should do for you in general practice or us in secondary care is alert us to, might this patient in front of me have heart failure? And then we need to go on and think about pretest probabilities that will increase our likelihood of diagnosing heart failure. So what are these things that we can do then? Uh, to, um, to try and get ourselves from the patient in front of us with suspected chronic heart failure to a diagnosis of heart failure. So you've got your risk factors that you've talked about earlier, obviously diabetes, hypertension, ischemic heart disease. You've got some symptoms and signs that are concerning you. A simple thing you can do is an ECG. It, you're, it, is, it is highly unlikely a patient has heart failure if they have a normal ECG, only 2% of patients. So you can do an ECG. Ideally, you want to do an atretic peptide test. Remember, natriuretic peptides are hormones produced by the heart when it fails. 
that go and circulate and cause vasodilatation, naturesis, they offset the upregulation of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system and sympathetic nervous system that are upregulated in heart failure and causing all the fluid retention. So we can use these peptides to help us. And of course, the one that we're nice asked us to use is N terminal pro BMP. Nice uh, suggests some thresholds for you. So if your NT pro BMP is very high, you notice here the units are a bit different, but our units in the UK, so if it's above uh, 2,000, you want to refer the patient rather urgently within two weeks to get a specialist opinion because it's a bad prognostic sign. If you're elevated a bit between 400 and 200, you can relax a bit uh, and send the patient uh, to see a cardiologist within uh, about six weeks. So do the peptides. If the peptides are normal, think of something else as the cause of the patient's breathlessness because heart failure is very unlikely. Okay, but the BMP is high. I'm afraid you can't stop there. Again, it's a non-specific marker of cardiorenal dysfunction. So if you've got renal failure and you, you can't clear BMP, it will be elevated. And there are a whole host of other reasons it might be. So you then have to go on and prove there is cardiac dysfunction. And the normal way, of course, is you send the patient uh, into a hospital to have, hopefully, a one-stop assessment, including an echo. Then, when we get the patient, we essentially look at the echo, decide whether there is a cardiac problem on the echo, and then classify the patient into a phenotype of what type of left ventricular dysfunction they've got. And we'll come back to that in a minute. We're not stopped there, because remember, it's a syndrome. We then have to say, OK, there's cardiac dysfunction. The patient's got reduced left ventricular function or preserved. What's the underlying cause of that cardiac dysfunction and try to treat it? OK, so these are the basic things you've got to do. A peptide, usually NT pro BMP in this country, a 12 EDCG, get the patient, patient referred for an echo, do a chest x-ray. It's probably not going to help you with your diagnosis of heart failure because the, yeah, you might see pulmonary edema, but it's unlikely, or a big heart. The, the, the heart size is normal in about 50% of patients with heart failure, but you don't want to miss a lung tumour or some other common cause of breathlessness. So do a chest x-ray and do some routine bloods. Use these, uh, full blood count, thyroid function, uh, obviously, anemia can cause heart failure, hypo or hyperthyroidism can cause heart failure. You want to check uh, whether the patient has diabetes or not, check their lipids, and check whether they've got iron deficiency uh, anemia, which is easily treated. Okay, so our side of the equation, once you've got the patient to us, um, and your side of the equation, when you get a report back from us, you're going to get into uh, what type of cardiac dysfunction the patient has. And broadly, there are really two. We separate the patients here into those who have reduced left ventricular systolic function. You see here a huge left ventricle that's not pumping very well. And this other type called heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, where the heart's pumping away fine. The problem is usually there's left ventricular hypertrophy atrial fibrillation, the heart's stiff, doesn't relax properly, leaves blood behind in the lungs, makes the patient breathless or hef-pef. So that's the broad categorization. We have actually made it slightly more complicated in the most recent um, version of the European guideline, and I suspect this will filter down to NICE quite, quite soon. We've, we've we still caused heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, those who have an ejection fraction less than or equal to 40%. Preserved ejection fraction heart failure above 50% with some other problem on the echo showing there's cardiac dysfunction. And we've now got a, mid, a, a, a category in the middle here, which is called mildly reduced systolic function. We've done this because these patients look very alike, reduced ejection fraction heart failure patients, and they respond to therapy in much the same way, maybe just to a slightly uh, less uh, greater magnitude. Okay. Then, unfortunately, and this is mainly concerns you a bit, but also concerns us a lot, is what on earth has caused the, the heart to fail. And of course, there are many, many uh, diseases here because essentially heart failure is the end stage of, of all serious cardiovascular disease. 
Obviously, the big four for us are coronary artery disease, so prior myocardial infarction or angina leads to about 60% of heart failure. Hypertension, very common. Valvular heart disease as patients age becoming even more common. And then the group with dilated cardiomyopathy, whom you can't find a, a problem with a coronary arteries that's a mixed bag of genetic causes, uh, people who have survived myro, uh, viral myocarditis, and then a whole host of infiltrative and um, other rarer cardiac diseases that usually we need to sort out. So that leads the patient in hospital usually on quite a journey of different tests. Uh, sometimes the echo will tell us the problem if the, the aortic, there's aortic stenosis or amyloid. Often we do angiography to see those who've got narrowings and coronary arteries to see if we can sort that out. Increasingly, you'll see us using cardiac magnetic resonance imaging, which is very good for looking at things like sarcoid, infiltrative diseases, or amyloid as well. CT coronary angiography for the younger patients who are less likely to have coronary disease. Metabolic exercising testing in some where we're not sure what the breathlessness is due to and increasingly nuclear scanning or DPD bone scanning to detect amyloid because as the population ages, a lot of them getting amyloid. Okay, so once you've done your basic tests and got your echo, uh, basically all you've done is set the stage here to then um, allow you to commence and up-titrate and monitor the general pharmac pharmacology you need to get on board to treat the syndrome of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. It allows you to, or us in hospital, then to identify the subgroup of patients who will benefit from devices, pacemakers and defibrillators. We can target then, both of us, uh, specific therapies to the etiology of heart failure, treat the comorbidities and risk stratify those who've got worse, who've got advanced heart failure to more advanced levels of care, whether that's transplantation or palliative care. Okay, so let's turn to managing heart failure. Now, whether you've got hef or F or hef pef or hef whatever else, if you have fluid retention, so you have a raised JVP, peripheral edema or pulmonary crackles, you need a diuretic because the first thing you want to do for your patient is improve their symptoms. Yes, there are not huge randomised trials saying you'll improve their mortality, but I don't think that matters. You will make them feel better and you will reduce hospitalisations. We, of course, normally turn to loop diuretics, furosemide, bumetanide. Some use terazamide. I don't have a lot of experience of that. The caveat is choose the minimum dose of diuretic to get the patient's symptoms and signs of congestion away. With the new drugs we've got to treat progression of heart failure, you don't need to use the industrial doses of diuretics we all used um, when we were house officers. Really, start with 40 milligrams of furosemide or one milligram of bumetanide and see if that does the trick. The other thing I would say here is don't get obsessed about the renal function. Diuretics will cause a small reduction in renal function, and they will cause a slight increase in the creatinine. If your patient feels better, I wouldn't worry about it. The purpose is not to die with normal use and ease. Okay? <laughs> and for those people who tell me that diuretics have no evidence base in heart failure, if you look at all the major trials of ACE inhibitors, ARBs, whatever, they were done in a very high background use of loop diuretics. You could argue that the drugs that you're going to obsess about getting the patient on actually don't work without loop diuretics. So don't worry about diuretics. OK. Now, for the HEFREF patient, I'm afraid there is quite an a la carte dining menu here to get through. Uh, and that gets added to all of the time. Uh, I think for, for, for your purposes, this smaller table note menu is probably all you need to know about. So the key thing for patients with HEFREF is that they should be started or on an ACE inhibitor, a beta blocker, and a mineral corticoid receptor antagonist, so AKA spironolactone or a plerinone. And they should be on all of those drugs. They obviously have to be started at small doses, up titrated, 
looking at the patient's blood pressure and their renal function, hopefully with the help of some helpful nurses in the community and in hospital. So those are the, 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 the holy trinity of drugs that the patient needs to be on, class 1A in any guideline. We've now got two others to consider, uh, and one of them I suspect will be very much be considered by you in primary care, which is now the addition of an SGLT2 inhibitor, either dapagliflozin or empagliflozin, or indeed if the patient is diabetic, you also have the choice of sotagliflozin. And then probably for us initially in primary care, the uh, replacement of the ACE inhibitor with sacubitrol valsartan, which I'm just going to talk about the, the rationale for those two things very briefly, because these, this is the, the thing that's changed most since the previous uh, talk you probably had a few years ago. So sacubitrol valsartan is a replacement for an ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin receptor blocker it's, think of it as a RAS blocker plus, because it's got an ARB, in this case Valsartan, and it's also got a neprilysin inhibitor, Sucubitrol. A neprilysin is an enzyme that uh, breaks down the natriuretic peptides. So if you inhibit neprilysin, you'll get more natriuretic peptides, which are the good guys in heart failure. They cause natriuresis, vasodilatation. So that's the rationale of the RNA over an ACE or an ARB. And why are we suggesting it, and who are we suggesting it for? Well, in a huge trial, Paradigm HF, which published about 2015, Sucubitrol valsartan was compared to enalapro, a classic ACE inhibitor for heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction, in patients who'd remained symptomatic despite the ACE inhibitor, the beta blocker, the MRA, and Sucubitrol valsartan was better than an alapro. It made patients live longer, it made them feel better, and they came into hospital less. So that's why we're suggesting a switch to this drug uh, if patients remain symptomatic on the ACE inhibitor. Then heart failure's caught up with the diabetic world, and now we've got to consider the SGLT2 inhibitors that you've heard about earlier. They started off by you being used in type 2 diabetes, and lo and behold, they seem to present, prevent the development of heart failure. So now we've looked at them in patients with heart failure itself. And of course, you'd expect them to be good drugs for heart failure because they're pretty good diuretics. You know, if you block the, um, uh, the reabsorption of glucose in the proximal tubule, you get a huge osmotic diuresis, which would be expect to be, you would expect to be beneficial for heart failure patients. And lo and behold, that's what happened. So in patients with reduced ejection fraction heart failure, whether they have type 2 diabetes or not, it doesn't matter. Adding an, adding an SGLT2 inhibitor seems to be beneficial. Dapagliflozin was used in the DAPA-HF trial on top of ACE inhibitor, beta blocker, MRA. Patients lived longer and were, re, were uh, kept out of hospital longer with heart failure, and empagliflozin had similar results. Reduced hospitalizations for heart failure. This time it didn't reduce cardiovascular deaths, but I don't think it really matters. These drugs seem to work in heart failure. For patients who also had heart, fa uh, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and type 2 diabetes, there's another drug that has been looked at, which is sotagliflozin, and this was looked at in more severe heart failure patients who'd recently been hospitalized, and once again, sotagliflozin reduced cardiovascular deaths or heart failure hospitalizations. So these drugs are now added to our armamentarium for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, and you can start them in general practice. They have few side effects. They don't lower blood pressure that much. They cause a slight transient reduction in uh, kidney function, which resets after about a month. They don't need a lot of titration. One dose, 10 milligrams of dapagliflozin or 10 milligrams of empagliflozin. So these are the, this is the management simplified, an ACE or an ARNI if the patient's getting worse, a beta blocker, spironolactone or a plerinone, a glyphosin, dapagliflozin or empagliflozin, and a diuretic. These are the class one drugs. 
We make decisions in hospital based on ejection fraction and QRS duration about defibrillators and pacemakers. Don't worry too much about that. Then if symptoms persist, you're into really the a la carte dining therapy or the older drugs that we used for heart failure, digoxin, uh, which may be used, hydralazine and nitrate if your patient can't tolerate an ACE inhibitor because of renal dysfunction, or if they're Afro-Caribbean, hydralazine nitrate helps, uh, evabradine if the patient's in sinus rhythm with a high heart rate. But these are more, really, I think, for decisions in secondary care. To say a little bit about the new category that we've um, constructed of heart failure with mildly reduced ejection fractions, so those with ejection fractions between 40 and 50 percent, really the same drugs. The evidence is not as strong uh, because there are no trials in that narrow group of patients, but all the evidence from meta-analysis suggests that patients who have reduced ejection fraction will benefit from an ACE, beta blocker, MRA, Zucubitol, Valsartan, and indeed there's just new data for glyphosins as well. To finish uh, with the treatment of the other type of heart failure, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, most often elderly women, people with hypertension, left ventricular hypertrophy, atrial fibrillation. Not so much to do, I'm afraid. Treat, screen for and treat the underlying cardiovascular diseases, which will be hypertension, uh, coronary artery disease, diuretics, of course, reducing body weight. Um, so it actually, if you think about hypertension and ischemic heart disease being the main drivers of heart failure, these patients all end up on ACE inhibitors, um, beta blockers, and if they're resistant to hypertension, on mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists anyway. So actually, they don't look that different at the end of the day. SGLT2 inhibitors, again, might help. Now, we're not there yet because this drug is not licensed for use in HEFPEF yet, but there's been a trial just a few weeks ago reported with empagliflozin in patients with heart failure and ejection fractions above 40%, and empagliflozin reduces cardiovascular mortality and hospitalizations for heart failure, whether patients are diabetic or not. So I think we're going to see these drugs, to be honest, used across the entire spectrum of heart failure very shortly. Just to end um, with some philosophical thoughts here, or more to do with um, heart failure service delivery. You see from the cocktail of drugs that the patients have to be on and the device options, no one person can deliver all this uh, care, up titration of drugs, checking of renal function, checking of blood pressure adequately. Or if you can, you can do it for one or two patients, but you can't do it for the tsunami of patients out there with heart failure. And I've spared you talking about the epidemiology today because we all know it's a disease that's increasing in prevalence and incidence. So really, you, patients with heart failure have to be managed as part of a multi-professional heart failure team. Hopefully in the UK we are getting there. So within your heart failure service in your communities, and the community should include general practice and secondary care and tertiary care, you hopefully should have access to a heart failure cardiologist, heart failure specialist nurses in the hospital and the community who can help you with doing all this complex uh, investigation, treatment, and up titration, so that no matter where the patient starts their healthcare journey, either with you in general practice, from the coronary care unit, from the general medical wards, they all get access to the correct diagnosis, the correct treatment with appropriate monitoring, and advanced care therapies where that's necessary. And I'm going to stop there. Thank you.